So, Marquez, it is delightful to be here, not least because Reed and I have a little East Coast, West Coast rivalry going. Interesting. And you are such a New Jersey stalwart, but I have to ask because you grew up in Maplewood. Mm -hmm. And the thing I know about Maplewood is the Maplewood pool is the best. It has the best grilled cheese, the best water slides, the best everything. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, disagree? Do you have fond memories? Tell me about the Maplewood pool. Agree. I have good memories from Maplewood pool. I have one bad memory because I never really got used to the diving board stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time I was there, which was a long time ago, but they had the diving boards, which was like, I don't know, six feet, 10 feet, whatever. And I got a little excited and went a little too high off the diving board. And uh, it was one of those things where you land in the water and then you like think you're going to swim to the top and then you're not at the top yet. And then you have to swim again to the top. And it, <laughs> just just one bad memory from the pool. But I would say, yeah, Maplewood's got a lot going for it. For Super sure. clutch. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is probably our most unusual beginning to our <laughs> podcast ever. <laughs> but that was the reason I was curious because I don't even know what this pool is, although I can guess. It's great. So what device would you most want to see AI brought to and and why and what would that do in terms of like expanding our possibilities? Oh, there's so many things, especially because it's we're right in that time where AI seems to just be popping up everywhere. Especially, I play golf and this is one of those things where there's not too many gadgets in golf, but immediately we were like, we're going to use AI to fix your swing, to help you hit yardages more consistently, to play better golf. And I was like, oh, I love this. This overlap is awesome. But where hasn't it shown up yet? There are maybe a couple last big uh, frontiers that maybe I'm not as familiar with, but things like manufacturing, things like just generally uh, attacking climate change and big human problems with AI, because we see all the 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 customer facing stuff. We see chat GPT, we see uh, all the little tools that show up in Photoshop and things like that. But I just... I figure it's it's getting so powerful so quickly that we want it to address humanity's biggest problems, and ideally, it is being deployed to do that as much as it can. A hundred percent. I mean, I think to kind of speculate a little bit, like for example, but even take this conversation we're having here. We're in your really great, excellent studio. You could imagine the AI might be listening to the conversation we're having and then say, "Ooh, ask Marquez this question," mm-hmm. or "Or hey, this would be a." Th- a theme with with Reed or um, hey, did you know? For example, did you know Marquez was really loved golf? And there could be something really interesting about how a golf could help Marquez with his swing, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like mm-hmm. as particular, and, you know, and that kind of thing would is part of the amplifying effect of humanity right. because it's it's the how do you make us connect with ourselves with each other more is actually, I think, part of the thing that people are not focusing on. They're, they're like, there's all this artifact. It's going to be AI. It's like, no, it's going to make our lives richer. I find that fascinating, especially the podcast version of this. I think I, I've i interviewed some people on podcasts before or just tried to do good interviews in my media career. And one of the things that I found is a really, really good interview typically asks questions that have never been asked of that person before. Like one of my favorite interviewers, Sean Evans, you've seen Hot Ones. He'll ask questions that are not just like, bounding off of something else that they've been interested in but it's like well researched and the timing of it is great and it's just that moment of the good question and the thoughtful answer is great and i wonder if ai trained on everything that's already happened could come up with something unique that hasn't already happened of course it'll come up with great things alongside what's already happened but i i just i love those human moments of like now that's good and i wonder if ai can actually help with that sort of thing Right. And it can it give the creative spark that we need to sort of go to the next level? And can you say, like, search every podcast I've ever been on. I don't want to answer this, ask the same question again. Mm-hmm. would be sort of awesome. Yeah. Um, so I rewatched your video uh, introducing Dolly 2. And unlike many people who, you know, they see Dolly and they're like, oh, my God, it's going to put people out of work. You know, this is terrible. It was so clear that you were like, this is awesome. <laughs> like, yeah. I, this can do so much. You talked about your graphic designer and also how far it would come. We've come a long way it's since uh, Dolly 2, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, a year ago. What would you say about the evolution of that for your own work? If we take it down from humanity to what you're doing, how can you use AI to amplify you? Yeah. So I, I think one of the biggest conclusions I came to when just trying this stuff for the first time is it's not going to replace me, but it is really, really good as a tool to help me make better stuff, whether it's make faster stuff or make the same quality stuff uh 
more easily or make better stuff than I ever have. And so with the tools getting even better and accelerating and how much better they get, I feel like that's become even more true. And the one interesting sort of tweak to it that I've sort of added to my perspective on it is the skill now that becomes important for people like me is being able to create a good prompt that can actually help it help me. Uh, I think if you ask someone like 20, 15, maybe 10 years ago, what their most useful skill online would be, it's like, I know how to type a certain set of words into Google to get exactly (laughs) what I need to find. And I think this next sort of evolution of all these AI tools is like, I know how to turn these knobs or to type in this prompt to get exactly what I need out of this AI. And that's my skill. And that's why I'm able to be so good at what I do. Because engineers make this, they describe it as prompt engineering. I think this alienates people because most people go engineering. That's what a few other people do. It's this arcane thing. It's only kind of geeks like the three of us who are like, woo, engineering, that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think of it more as like prompt directing, right? So it's kind of like, like the direction you'd give an actor, the direction you'd give... Have you played with your prompt directing at all? Because like the kinds of easy tips are like, do this in the style of Ernest Hemingway. Of yeah, yeah. I mean, so the most common thing that I do is I like to end reviews with an alliteration. So after the 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 big pixel review I did last year, it was like the the pixel perfect something something. I made some great analogy, and a lot of that came from me asking ChatGPT for an analogy based on my video script. And the more I do this prompt engineering, the more I find that there are certain things that I can ask for, now make it shorter, now make it more punchy, now make it, you know, this and that, and I keep trying new things. And I think the more you do the same type of prompt over and over again, the more you find you can sort of twist it and bend it and find ways to do what you want better. Well, so, you know, the whole promise of technology is democratization. And so, you know, thousands of years ago, only a you know, subset of people could write and then only a subset people can read. And now with more AI, you were, you were one of the first creators, you know, you were creating YouTube videos when you were in high school. Mm -hmm. And part of the promise can be that now anyone can do it. Anyone with the help of AI or ChatGPT or Dolly can be a more prolific creator, can be a better creator. Like, what do you think about these AI tools helping sort of the next generation of creators come on board? Yeah, it's really interesting. I, One of the most common questions that I get because of how long I've been a creator is, could you get started again today? And if so, like, how could you get started? Mm -hmm. And while I don't have a perfect answer for that because the landscape is so different, I do think that the barrier to entry is lower than ever before. So even 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I was starting, you had to have some sort of knowledge of how to get these files together, edit them together, put it on online. YouTube was relatively young. Now it's like, the phone in your pocket, <laughs> that's a 4K, 30 FPS, high quality video, like bang on instantly. And with all these AI tools, I do think the barrier, not just the barrier to entry, but the barrier to entry to good quality mm-hmm. content is also lower than ever. Mm-hmm. So again, like you can get, you know, a 4K, 30 FPS video out of your phone, but it might not be that interesting or it might not have that great of a topic. And I think now because of all these tools to help you brainstorm and help you come up with new ideas and refine these ideas, suddenly, if you're good enough at this, the barrier to entry to making a really good, interesting story is also lower. So that's the one thing I think is consistent. I still couldn't tell you exactly how to start a YouTube channel in 2023 because yeah. all I can do now is run a 15-year-old channel. <laughs> but I can say the barrier to entry is lower and people are making really good stuff because of it. I mean, I love you saying the barrier to entry to good content is also lower because I feel like we're having the same conversation. 15 years ago, everyone was like, yeah, YouTube's fine, but it's all crap. It's just going to be millions of videos that aren't good. And I, people mm-hmm. are saying the same thing with AI. Oh, we're just going to get millions of books that are bad and millions of this that are bad. And that might be true, but to your point, it can also raise people up and it can also create better content. So it's not just that it can create schlock, but we can also see the best of the best become better. The best directors, the best creators, the best people can still level up with AI, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. And there's more, there, it's still right that there will be a lot of random garbage and totally. that's fine. <laughs> and that's how YouTube started too. And that's fine. Yes. But the fact that we will get a higher volume of high quality stuff is awesome yeah. too. Yeah. And by the way, that's been the true history of media anyway. If you look at the explosion of cable channels and much other stuff. Just yeah. go watch the infomercials on on, on good cable channels. Like, okay, this, not great. this is not great. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the kind of the 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 inspiration behind various kinds of content creation, and we can be 
YouTube focused or, you know, online media focused. But, you know, part of what I was a little, as usual, disheartened by, like the whole Hollywood discussion around, oh my God, this will be replacing human beings. Like, look, let's be focusing on how to make more human stories, how to do this better, how to amplify human beings. I can see all kinds of ways in which AI from, you know, not just script writing or research assisting or or challenging or plot twists or alliteration, mm-hmm. you know, as kind of ways of doing it. What what have been some of the ways you've been thinking about the this is new vistas or new heights that are enabled by AI? Yeah. So I'll give you an example in my own workflow. So I make a lot of YouTube videos and those videos go online to an audience where I'm fortunate enough to have a ton of feedback the second the video goes up. So there's hundreds, thousands of comments from people who've watched what I made and reacted to it. Super useful. Now, what I have found is like I've gotten really good at certain types of videos. I can review a new gadget. I can test or explain a new thing. But since I've been doing it for so long, I want to sort of branch out into new things and find new things my audience is interested in. A new tool comes along, and I'm not going to remember the name of it off the top of my head, but essentially what it lets me do is it sorts through all of the comments across all of the videos on all of the channels that I make and finds the most common things that people in my audience are, are talking about amongst themselves and wondering about in their own questions amongst themselves And that gives me insight into new ideas of what I can then make videos about for them. So even without them asking for a certain type of video or me having to go to Twitter and be like, what do you guys want to see? Like, that's not going to help me very much. But these these sort of summarization tools and insight tools I'm able to use are genuinely very good and have given me video ideas that I then executed on and I think have gone really well. And people go, I didn't even realize I wanted this, but this is great. The, The fact that that actually works and that's a real workflow that's created better content that exists in the world in 2023, and this is the worst it'll ever be, right. I think is pretty sweet. I think that's a pretty promising start. What are some of the most interesting side angles you have had in creating your show? And one of the reasons this question occurred to me is obviously we walked by the casket on the way into the <laughs> studio. <laughs> like, I can explain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. You, you never want to be predictable. Yes. And you want to keep your audience on their toes a little bit. You want to be reliable, but not predictable. I yes. think that's a good way of, of saying yeah. uh, the casket, if you would, <laughs> if I can explain, <laughs> yes. is, you know, as a, as a review, as a product review channel, we get a, a ton of emails and requests and 99% of them we say no to. But, you know, just around the studio for a while, I think I just tweeted like one of these days, I'm going to say yes to everything just so you guys can see how ridiculous the inbox gets. Mm-hmm. And then at the studio, we were like, wait a second, that's. Let's actually do that. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and we just picked a month and we said yes to everything and a casket and a, a bunch of weird cases and all kinds of crazy stuff shows up. But I think that comes from just having a lot of smart people at the studio and, and many minds is better than one mind. So that's fun. Um, but yeah, we have all kinds of like tangential, weird angles to things that seem fun just because like we already know what the bread and butter is, which is new product comes out. Is it good or not? Should you buy it? Yes or no? We can do that all day, but if we only do that, that's going to get boring. So we like to find the business angles, the strategy angles, the stories, the things that sort of are intertwined with all these product releases and have fun with those too. And it's funny because in in the tech world, it is kind of surprising how much stuff is sort of like right in the middle average. Uh, Whenever you ask about like, what are the hardest products to make? Tech products are kind of the hardest to make. And so if you get everything together in like building a company, getting your product off the line, like it goes through so many lines of approval and people that by the time it comes out, it's got to be at least decent at something to exist, to have gotten this far. Mm -hmm. So endless products show up here at the studio that are completely fine. Fine. They're just... (laughs) fine you know and yeah. they're not like exciting or interesting to make a video about and i could and there are gonna be people who, people who buy them but like i don't know that it kind of feels a little boring to focus on what's fine yes. so it is especially exciting to find things that are really really good and things that are really really bad because then you know it's the psa where it's just like just so you know this is actually incredibly bad don't buy this or this is really really great it's surprising how great this is you should probably consider this over the other options. And we've done both. Have you seen our Dyson headphones video? I called it the worst product I've ever reviewed. And it might not be the worst product I've ever reviewed, but it's pretty bad. It's one of the worst things I've ever made a video about. It's So Dyson makes vacuums and sure. filters and yeah. all kinds of other things like that. They made a pair of headphones that includes 
air filters in the ear cups and then a connecting a connecting like oh, breathing tube around <laughs> your mouth where it filters in clean air and passes it over your nose and mouth. And this is another collab I did with a doctor <laughs> who was like passing cold air over your mucous membranes 100% of the time is already a bad idea. <laughs> but also here's all the other reasons why this is a bad idea. And th- it was a really fun video to make. But I guess the point is not that many truly horrible stuff actually shows oh, cause, up. Cause of, oh, because of the filtration of what it takes to actually build these things. Yeah, there's so many layers and so many so much money required right. that you usually don't get to a final product without it being decent. You obviously have a uh, deep love of products and gadgets. And like, where did this come from? Like when, from a young age was this here? Like, was there a moment? Tell us. It's one of those weird things where I feel like I've always been into tech. Yeah. Uh, I do have a super, super early memory of playing with the JVC camcorder in the like, everyone has like a junk drawer or a junk closet totally. or whatever <laughs> my parents had. And I just like... It, there was a camcorder in there and some tapes and I figured out how to charge the batteries and I just ran around the house taking videos of things and it's not like I could edit anything. So I was like editing in tape and like making a little movie on a camcorder oh and like that was so satisfying as a however many nine years old, whatever I was. So I it doesn't get much further back than that for me, but I just feel like I've always been interested in making stuff and interested in products and tech that actually work. That's awesome. You were growing up in the start of the internet age. You obviously, the mobile age sort of came about right when you were um, uh, starting with your YouTube videos. Now, obviously, the age of AI. Like, where do you think we are in the arc of technological progress? Like, you've seen gadgets change. You've, it's a big question. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> do you have thoughts about sort of where we are at this time in history, where we're going? Do you even think about it? Maybe you don't care. I kind of do. I feel like there's a lot of arcs. There's a lot of arcs that sort of follow similar shapes, but they are all happening at different times. So like if you just asked about the arc of smartphones, mm-hmm. which is one that I've followed extremely so closely, closely, like mm-hmm. we had we had that explosive moment, which a lot of people was 2007. And we get up to like, what's the difference between this iPhone and the last iPhone? Totally. Right. It's very incremental <laughs> at this point. We're up here yeah. like they're mature. But ask about EVs, electric cars, for example, they're having that explosive moment now where like we went from five years ago almost nobody even considering an EV to five years from now, you will have dozens and dozens of really good competing EVs in multiple categories to choose from. But we're right at this interesting point where like, there's only three electric trucks. So every single one gets compared to the existing three. And it's like, we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll get there eventually. (laughs) But like, that's where we are in that curve. So I just see a bunch of curves all happening and at various times. And I guess it sort of depends on which one you're asking about. But that's how I see it. Well, by the way, electric vehicles, I mean, I've, you know, this is said more as a personal, although I've done a bunch of investing in autonomous vehicles and so forth, because I actually think, you know, we're all going to, there's 40,000 deaths and a lot more injuries per year in the U.S. alone. Yep. We're going to see a huge improvement on that and all this stuff. And EV will be part of it. I think one of the funny things that, the only thing I would say about the EVs that may not be common knowledge is that it's actually, in fact, a software revolution. It's moving cars from mechanical engineering to a software engineering. That's true. Paradigm. Yeah. And so the what happens when the EV becomes the equivalent of a software platform that's programming for a data center that is using not just autonomous vehicles, but everything from like you could imagine, like for example, a future software thing is like a person having a heart attack on the road, and it says, "Oh." I see the person's having a heart attack and it immediately diverts and takes them to the hospital. Yeah. Right. Like that kind yeah, yeah. of thing is part of the thing. What what do you see as this like I completely agree with you at the beginning of the day? What what does that future curve for EVs look like? So it's interesting. Even within EVs, as you're describing this, I feel like there are two curves. One is the software connectivity, the software platforms that are our cars. But the other is definitely the hardware, mm-hmm. which is just like every once in a while I'll test or drive a gas car. And the difference between uh like an average EV and an average gas car is it's massive. It, it, the EV is going to weigh a thousand extra pounds. The EV is going to be 10,000 extra dollars. And the EV is going to have its certain advantages like instant torque, like more space. It, it might have two trunks. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that come with that hardware platform versus the gas one. And I think interestingly, the the software stuff is happening kind of at the same time, maybe just because of efficiency. If you're if you're trying to make an autonomous car and you have a gas drivetrain, it's not able to be as responsive as just a computer on wheels. So I think that kind of coincides a little bit. But I always talk about this one thing when I make these EV reviews, which is what are the we're so early with EVs, what are the best types 
of cars to go electric. Because when you go, I always use the Cadillac Escalade as an example. When you go electric, you're going to make it way heavier. You're going to make it way more expensive. You're also going to make it quieter, smoother, and more responsive to drive. So let's pick the things that are already heavy and expensive and just make them quieter and smoother and more responsive. So the Cadillac Escalade, what better car to go electric than the big, heavy, expensive seven-seater And now they're going to make an electric Escalade and it's going to be great and it's going to be expensive, but it's going to be the best Escalade ever. But when you look at sports cars, the engineering of that hardware is so much harder. Sports cars are about lightweight responsiveness. The most impressive sports car I've ever driven that's electric, the Rimats Nevera, $2 million, 2,000 horsepower. Did they send one you one of those for free? I wish they sent one of those. (laughs) That showed up in the parking lot last month. (laughs) Craziest car I've ever driven. But even as you drive it and you corner in that $2 million hypercar, you're like, this thing is heavy. I can feel that this thing is heavy. So there are certain types that are going to take much more of that curve to get to actually being good and mature. And I think we'll get there eventually. Battery tech's got to get better. The electric motor's got to get smaller and lighter. But yeah, when you talk about pickup trucks, Escalades, like we're getting the ones that make sense right off the bat, which is makes sense. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, but I think one of the things I agree completely with your views. Um, I recently got a Ford Mach-E, which I like. Yep. Um, but the thing I keep watching for is when the software parts of it really start taking off. And I think it's, other than autonomous vehicles, I think it's a little too early for some of the AI stuff, obviously, you have connected cloud. You can have a much better assistant. You know, one of the things you you put, for example, we mentioned Apple. You put Siri next to ChatGPT, and it's like the <laughs> the, the old dead one, <laughs> dead thing versus the modern interesting thing. Yeah. Um, but like envisioning what that software defined future is, because for example, like you can imagine the question of like what what is the real time collective data map that happens from all of these cars being network devices. I mean, think about like how it fixes traffic, how it fixes like all of the stuff. Yeah, this is one really interesting reason I think a lot of people are optimistic about Tesla specifically Mm -hmm. is because they are, I don't wanna say shameless, but they are so obviously collecting so much information from all of this and training their neural net and their computers on all this information that they're getting better hand over fist at a rapid rate because of all the data they have. I kind of wonder if others are going to start doing the same thing as quickly as they have. But yeah, it's like, I I, I remember talking to Neil deGrasse Tyson about like the future of cars could maybe just be like every car can talk to every other car and you can just take your hands off the wheel and it will communicate and weave and zigzag in a way to get to your exit in a much faster and safer way than you ever could as a human. How far away is that future? I don't know, but it feels like a software problem part of that talking to each other is not just the safety of the cars. Think about like if the cars are talking to each other and you're driving down a city street and car number one says, hey, I saw a kid playing with a ball behind right. this car yep. and communicates that to the other cars that are driving yeah. nearby. There are so many good yes. examples just like that. Yeah. And especially when they can then learn from each other instantly. Yeah. My my thing about cars, and I think you've probably also seen this, is like people just keep their cars for so long that yeah, right. in order to have every car on the road be that responsive, it's it's a natural built-in extra couple decades of just people with their current cars. Um, and then there's this weird middle point where it's like half the cars on the road are new and have this tech, and the other half are people trying to avoid things happening with the cars talking to each other. It's crazy. So I don't know how to get over that hump, but we're going to have to get there yeah. to get to that future. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting. Totally. So there's so many ways to be involved in technology. Like you're clearly excited about EVs. You're a founder, you're a creator, you're a product reviewer. Um, But I also think you're an investor. And so when you think about what are the companies and products to invest in, like, how do you look at that? What's your lens? So this is interesting. I I am a pretty new investor, I will say, but I am. And I think I'm just generally most curious about and optimistic about companies that are when you sort of extend what they're doing to its natural conclusion way down the road. Um, So obviously now they could be working on a single gadget or a single technology, but if you just use like Tesla as the example of like, okay, build this tech on top of this tech and extrapolate it to all of the categories and move all of it forward and look where the world is now, if you can see that meaningful progress, then I'm interested. That's the type of company I think makes a great investment and just makes sense to be invested in, in in whatever way you can. So I don't even have any examples off the top of my head, but I just I just generally think like trying to extrapolate forward as far possible and seeing what that lands me in my head. If I if I feel good about that, then 
then I'm interested. Well, I love that lens. It's like how an investor should be. How can we make the world better? How can we use AI technology products to increase humanity? And I think that's great. Yeah. You know, it might be interesting. I don't know. You, your platform might make this worthwhile. It's generally speaking, you always want to be surprised by the inventiveness of the network of entrepreneurs is usually how you're trying to do as investors. So like, it's good to have a thesis driven investment thesis just to have a prepared mind and be no knowing stuff. But the usual thing, like when I'm asked that question is like, Oh, like what to invest in is like, I want to be surprised by the really different and interesting entrepreneur, okay. right? Like huh. it's not what I've pre thought of, Yeah, but there might be a thing with your platform that might be interesting, which is say, Hey, I am intrigued by products that solve the, that have a good theory of how to solve this need or this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Cause you have enough reach yeah. that you might then get someone goes, Oh, I'm working on something like that. And you could take a look at it and see if it works. Definitely. And yeah, it's also about like when you see that one solution applied to this one problem, but they clearly have the ability to apply this solution to way more problems because it's a clever and a unique solution. Then that, I, I love that. I talk about that. And, and especially some of these bigger companies, they come out with products and I'm, I naturally extrapolate. Like I look at what Google just did with their software and the camera and I'm like, all right, this is clearly like, what's the next phone going to do? And then the next one after that, like th I, I guess my brain t tends to just fast forward a little bit and see if it, it can arrive at its natural conclusion sometime later. So this is actually one of the things that I thought has been kind of under delivered it's partially because you know apple is you know kind of so asleep on ai that it's kind of you know snoozing in the back seat um you know google's obviously more active but what's a what is ai going to do to revolutionize the phone right have you have you thought about that in ways that you can share yeah so there's a little a little bit of that from google already so if you watch google's latest event which is just a couple weeks ago they had this moment where they sort of casually went over, we're now combining Google Assistant with Bard, and mm. there will be features from Bard built into Google Assistant. And now Bard is like improving rapidly and multimodal and has all these features. And then they just moved on and they went with a bunch of other stuff. But in that moment, I was like, isn't this what we wanted from assistants in our phones? Like when we got Siri, when we got Google Assistant, even if you look back at early Alexa, I think the idea behind them is that maybe someday it'll be the computer from Star Trek and we'll just talk to it naturally and we'll arrive at, it'll just do what you asked for it to do. And they've not really delivered fully on a lot of those promises. I think Siri can do some basic stuff like set some timers and open web pages and apps and things like that. And Google Assistant has some more functionality and I've played with them and I've done videos comparing all of them. But I think as far as AI on phones, I want to be able to just, ask my phone to do something and just have it do it to actually do what I asked for it to do. So I suspect that that's going to be a sort of inflection point of getting to that point. So speaking of AI, one of the things and we speaking of inflection point, <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Speaking <laughs> of inflection on a different thing. Um, you probably know that I've uh, co-founded an AI company. It's the first thing since LinkedIn uh, inflection with deep minds, Mustafa Suleiman. And, um, you know, since you do product reviews, we thought we'd, bring pie into the conversation. Okay, sure. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, our goal is a, you know, kind, supportive companion, offering conversation, advice, concise information, but also something that helps everybody kind of navigate their life as a kind of a good, you know, kind of like friendly and helpful person that helps and helps amplify and navigate their life. What I will do is ask Pi a question. We'll have Pi answer. And then we'll ask you to do a follow-up question, okay. right? Does that sure. work? That, yeah. that work? Okay. So, hi, Pi. I like creating. How will AI help the most prolific creators make original and impressive content in the year 2028? Hey there, that's a really cool question. I think AI will help creators in two main ways. First, AI will help with the grunt work, like creating 3D models, editing videos, and fine-tuning the sound. This will free up more time for the creator to focus on the creative aspects of their work. Second, I think AI will be able to generate interesting ideas that can inspire the creator and spark new ways of thinking. Together, these two trends could lead to a huge explosion of creative work in the future. So my follow-up question would be, is there still a place for 
people who currently edit videos or what was the other thing it said? Edit videos or do sound refinement? Fine tuning the sound. Fine tuning the sound. Is there still a place for creators to do those things to add quality on top of what AI will be able to do? So my answer to that would be yes. But I suspect it's a yes. Yes. But, but like, I want to hear what AI would yes, say. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. All right. Let's see what we got. I think there will definitely still be a place for human expertise in editing and fine tuning. AI will be able to automate many of the more basic tasks, but I believe there is something special about a human touch that will still be valued. Plus, an AI will not be able to think creatively and critically in the same way that a human can. So there will always be room for human editors, sound designers, and other creative professionals to add their own unique perspective and touch to any piece of media. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good answer. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and I hope that that's right. Because I, when, when you say that, sort of like, all right, in the future, yeah, your video is just going to chop itself up and edit itself and like remove the background noise and be good. And it's like, well, that's my job. So, <laughs> so how does that work? So it is curious to see that, yes, that will be made easier and faster, maybe on a basic level, but then I'm going to come in with the human touch and create something genuinely new and creative on top of whatever AI was able to baseline cut for me, which is... That's what I want to hear. Yeah. I think yeah. there's two parts of it. The reason why there's still always going to be kind of for a long time human creativity. One is, is as we were talking about earlier, is the prompt directing. So like what you do, like yeah. what you get out is partially what you get in and what you put in is the thing in that. And there'll be specialization. And then the second part of that is, is that there will be a tendency somewhat obviated by the prompt directing to the fine output right? The safe output. Whereas you yeah. want the creative original spark that's something somewhat different. And that's another place where the creatives will come in, whether it's editing, mm -hmm. video, sound, et cetera, and still go, ah, this is the thing that makes it different from what's out there. Yeah. And even, especially because this was, I, whenever you talk about like really interesting, deep creative works, like movies or something like that, I think a lot of people extrapolate forward super far where they're like, are there going to be AI generated movies? And would an AI generated movie even be good? And I think a good movie either tugs on your heartstrings or inspires you, or there's something about it that's human that really gets to you. And I, I, I wonder if, if there is room again for the collaboration in the, the absolute highest end form of the arts where you can still improve the movie with AI, but also still have that human touch that makes it a good movie. Seems like it's a yes, hopefully. But I also think what you said about electric vehicles with the brilliance is also going to be with the EVs talking to each other. When we interviewed Mustafa Suleiman about Pi, that was his hope too, that you know your personal assistant would talk to Reed's personal assistant. And so that's like another amplification. So it's like you're talking to your personal assistant about editing or about, you know, you're feeling sick today. So maybe your, you know, editor can take over. And then they're talking to, you know, your graphic designers, Pi, or whatever it might be. So there's like another level of amplification if you like the different pies are talking to each other. Now, this is this is where it gets interesting because I've always thought, and this is this has been true since like the early assistant days of Siri and Google Assistant. It seems like there's a very direct trade-off between like privacy of information, mm. all of the information you have to give it for it to be this useful, and how convenient and good it will be. Mm -hmm. So like I have a Google account. My Google account knows everything about me, <laughs> but my God, is it useful? Like my calendar, my tasks, my inbox, right. everything, it's all there. I ask Google Assistant what's up today and it tells you you should leave early for work today because you live here work is here you want to arrive by this time for your calendar meeting but there's more traffic than usual on the normal route you take and it's just like you know everything about me but that's really useful yes and i wonder when you go that far out like okay my assistant knows everything about me yours knows everything about you and they're talking to each other does that get dicey? Like, is there ever a world where I don't want you or your assistant to know about my assistant? Like, that's that's a really interesting future. Well, there will be some errors, just like there's human errors, mm -hmm. right? Because even if you had like a human assistant who was delightful, occasionally there's an error. Sure, <laughs> right? sure. But like, as long as you realize there's some errors and it's learning mm -hmm. and it's it's entire, you know, raison d'etre, the reason for being is to be a good assistant to you in his learning, mm -hmm. then I think that builds the trust and so forth. It just it has to come with a it will not have, you know, zero percent errors. Yeah. I think I think a lot of the AI 
should be in its evolution compared to a good version of what a human can do. So like when you look at self-driving cars, I think it's really just about getting the error rate down. Like how many people die for, for this many miles of driving? Get that down. It'll be a better version of human drivers if it can get to that metric. Okay, you have an assistant on your phone. What would a good assistant human be able to do? Can it do all those things? Can we get to that benchmark? That's a win for the AI tool. And you just kind of do that across the board. Find the good human, get better than the good human, then the tool makes sense. The other thing about it is to use the advantages, like don't try to to make the AI better at the things it's really work, weak at. Sometimes you'll do that, but use it where it has an advantage. So think about like having a tutor on your smartphone, mm. infinitely patient. Unlike human <laughs> beings who occasionally yeah. are like, ah, I've explained this to you five times. Sure. I'm really tired of it. Yeah. You know, you go, no, no, let's try again. It's a superpower. It <laughs> right. has a superpower. It has a superpower. And, sure. and to deploy those superpowers in ways that amplify our humanity. So I, uh, it's what you said and this, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. There's going to be ways, especially because why, why aim for the good human when there are reasons where it can be way, 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 way better than the good human. Yes. But that I think is like further down the line, especially if I go back to the cars example, it's like, there's no way every human on the road could talk to every other human right. on the road and figure out where to drive based on the guy six cars behind you and what he's going to do. Like that's way, that's the superpower of AI. Yes, yeah, exactly. For sure. And I think to your point about comparing it to the good human, sometimes we expect technology to be fallible. And to your point, if we could just have cars that were twice as good as humans and so we had half the deaths, yeah. that's amazing. Like that's a trade-off we want to make. Yep. And I think in the privacy sphere, people don't want to give up privacy when it's so XYZ company can make an, ex an extra buck. But it's so that you can get to your job on time. Like that's what you're you know, willing to give up. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people really do make that very direct trade-off. And and they're, they're unhappy when they feel like they've given up too much and don't get the convenience back. Right. So yeah, when I use Google Assistant, I'm going to get as much out of it as possible because I know it has all this information. And I think that's probably true about a lot of people. They, they understand that there is some sort of a trade-off. Let's move on to our rapid fire questions. Is there a movie, song, or book that fills you with optimism for the future? I have maybe an interesting answer. I'll give two. One is a Ongoing Thing by Vane Sill. It's a song that I've used in my intros in videos in the past for years. Awesome. But when you actually listen to the lyrics about, it's sort, of, it's sort of a motivating song, I guess, to me. But I think literally from cover to cover, all the lyrics speak to me. And I like, I like the lyrics of it a lot. And then the other one is... I want to get the name right. It's Prima Donna by Skogsra. And I don't think I'm saying that right, <laughs> but it doesn't have any words, but the arc of the song feels exactly like the arc of life. And it's really flowery and optimistic and great mm. at the end. And I think that's pretty cool. I'm going to have to listen to that. Yeah. That's awesome. That's going to be my pump up song. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what is, uh, and this, this can be silly or serious or professional. Um, what is a question that you wish people asked you more often? Um, Hmm. I think what's really interesting about the two worlds that I live in right now, which is Ultimate Frisbee. Okay, that's what I was going to say. Ultimate yeah, Frisbee and tech. <laughs> and tech is there's not a lot of overlap other than like, so how about that new iPhone? Like it's pretty basic. <laughs> so I, I think it would be more interesting to find, to, to have questions asked about that overlap. I think it would be fun, whether it's just like, AI and health training or or injury prevention or just getting better at the sport. I think it would be cool to to get asked about and to be also probably to ask others about like that overlap. I think that's really interesting. So um, next question, where do you see progress or momentum outside of your industry that inspires you? I'm just going to say ultimate again, just because, like I said, the the growth of the sport, not just in like how many people play, but in high level strategy, coaching, player development across the board in every division, in every age category, every five years, it's drastically better. And that's really, it's tough to say about a lot of sports because I think most sports people are familiar with are so established that like high school basketball today looks very similar to high school basketball 10 years ago. High school ultimate today looks nothing like high school ultimate 10 years ago. And especially the, the earlier footage you see, the more of a difference it's, it's, you can notice. So I'm, I'm very inspired by the progress of this, this little sport that I get to play on the weekends. Yeah. 
That's awesome. And you're you're not scared about the other folks coming for you. Uh, no, I mean, I know my prime is going to be a certain set length and then I'll be watching. Yes. You, you can be coaching next. Exactly. Um, so you have such a positive outlook for the future. Um, can you leave us with a final thought on what you think is possible if everything breaks humanity's way in the next 15 years? Like where could we go? And what's the first step to get there? Yeah, I think I love the thought of of the best technology being deployed on the biggest problems for humanity. And I think you see a little bit of that here and there, little sparks of that. Oh, a little, oh, a new rocket launch. Oh, oh, it landed itself. Okay, that's good. Maybe we'll get to Mars someday. Like little stuff like that is very inspiring. Um, also connecting the entire planet has been something that's been really fun to watch, whether it's just getting more communities online and then the entire world and all of humanity can talk to all of humanity and, and we all learn from each other. Um, so I think just in general, to zoom all the way out, yeah, technology at the highest level being deployed to solve humanity's biggest problems. Amen. Here, here. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. This was great. Yeah. Thank you. And in honor of our season two opening guest, we tip our hat to Marquez and his use of AI in his outros. Here goes. As creators, can we catch the current of computational capabilities? Crafting content, we contemplate how AI can carry our connection closer. Possible is produced by Wonder Media Network, hosted by Ari Finger and me, Reid Hoffman. Our showrunner is Sean Young. Possible is produced by Edie Allard, Sarah Schleed, and Paloma Moreno Jimenez. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer and editor. Special thanks to Surya Yalamanchili, Saida Sapieva, Ian Alice, Greg Beato, and Ben Rellis. A special thanks to Ben Davis and Evan Krask at WME, the MKVHD team for their studio and hospitality, and Little Monster Media Company. 